Greetings, everybody, in the name of Yeshua. It's uh, Boaz Newhoff and Rob again here with uh, In That Day. And we're going to talk today, continuing on, and our attention today is going to move to just catching up on the world situation today so that we have a context of what we need to intercede about, uh, not to be alarmed about, but to intercede about because we are convicted that we need to to bring this together with this information to be able to enable us to really begin to intercede for Yahweh's remnant people, which is the calling of Moses to the last generation in Leviticus 26, verses 40 to 44. Um, There comes a time when the last generation is called by Yahweh to attention and to make confession and to bring intercession. Now, we know that uh, the majority of people, uh, whilst they they are expectant of the end of the ages, are not necessarily understanding the, the Moses call to the last generation to acknowledge Yahweh's righteousness uh, and to acknowledge the ancient iniquities of our fathers and ourselves and confess that he was just to actually uh, cause the exile, bring it about, uh, and that part of his redemptive narrative, of course, is that we cannot redeem ourselves from the exile You know, we've labored in vain. We cannot make it happen. Some theologians, as we'll see in today's context, are thinking that they can bring this about by themselves and have their own millennial reign as they understand it. And we we know that that's not correct. So um, a little bit of a focus now on the global context, which enables us to begin to hear the heart of the Father. Not that we should become afraid or anxious of anything. That's, That's not what it's about. But that we should be able to pray and enter uh, with the right words that he's calling us to bring to him, as well as having wisdom, because we're seeking wisdom, about what is actually going on in the world today, which gives us clues about the timing of things, so that we do not fear, but we, 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 we have courage in Yahweh and his promises. The issue is it's that, as we spoke last week about the name of Yahweh, very important. We don't know the proper full understanding of the pronunciation today. But we know in whom we believe, and um, it says in in the Proverbs or um, in Jeremiah, I think it might be, I might be wrong, but it says, in the day of affliction, the righteous run into the name of Yahweh. And this is what it's about. This is about the covering, the pekida. And the covering comes before the zekira or the gathering. So there's a time in which we need to be covered, and there's a time in which we will be gathered. But the covering is a period that comes first. So what I'm going to talk about in terms of what is the global context is really we've got to get to the heart or the real global context. Our whole uh, approach up to this point is to pray for wisdom that we would have a true biblical eschatology of the last days. So I'm going to entitle this discussion, this discussion, The Emergence of Mystery Babylon, because that's really what we're expecting to happen. And And I think when we take note of what's going on immediately right now, we can see a lot of things are happening in double quick time. Now, I think the um, to get to this real global context and what is ahead, uh, which I'm titling is really the emergence of mystery Babylon, uh, is to discern that. I think if we look at the current G20 meetings, um, we, we see a lot about what is going on at the moment. Um, some of the report back is that the Trump-Putin relationship meeting went very well. It was mutually positively reassuring to both sides there, which is very interesting. And I'll, I'll, I'll put this in context uh, for, for as we go on. But Trump stood for an anti-globalist trade uh, situation. In other words, he 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 wants to go away. For, he, 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 he complained a lot about uh, the dumping of steel and all these kinds of things on the market, which is severely hammering the um, the U.S. economy and that this, all these agreements had to be renegotiated so that the economy could uh, again thrive and so on. And so there was, there was uh, some um, um, agreement there. There were some compromises made about that. So he was there. But the interesting thing is he also, so there was two things that Trump was actually uh, standing uh, alone from everybody else in the G20 meetings. That was on these dumping strategies and these global 
uh, trade agreements that were hammering the economy of the US. And also uh, he stood aside on this climate change agreements because that would also damage the economy. So that's the one thing. But on the other thing, we see that this Trump-Putin discussion lasted far longer than people expected it to be. And they tried to stop it for several times. But when you read uh, Putin's statements and Trump's statements, you'll see that actually they were, they were really mutually assured of their own um, growing relationship there. And of course, that now is being treated very negatively by the American media. So um, what you've actually got happening is that you will see clearly that there's a, there's, a, there's a struggle going on now between countries and leaders who want to stand for their national economies and their sovereignty and globalism. And uh, in the meanwhile, while they were having this, there was all the riots going on in the streets under the, the, well, they were saying that it was under global trade and all this kind of stuff. So it gives the appearances that it's under global trade, but actually they are more fascist left-wing, um, left-wing Marxist activists. So it's very interesting. Uh, what we see is not, we've got to go behind it to actually understand what they stand for to be able to make sense of all this. Now, what I bring to you is that the, um, uh, there was another report it happened at the same time where the Premier of uh, Italy uh, has shocked the EU um, by saying that Italy does not have a moral obligation anymore to continue to accept more immigrants. So, so this is very interesting of what's going on here. So he, that shocked the European uh, leaders, right, the ones that are trying to build the Europe, because obviously Italy is, is, is really dying under this whole situation that they find themselves in. Now, Step back from that, and this is what I found interesting. Um, in the last few days, I found uh, the latest reports on Rome indicate an increasing schism or struggle in the Vatican at the highest levels. It's between conservatives and uh, neo-Marxist uh, Je- Jesuitry type position where the Pope is in, because the, Je- because the Pope clearly supports the liberation theology, if you know anything about liberation theology, was developed in the 60s by the Jesuits in southern, southern America, South America, which then went over, fomented a lot of revolutions on the basis of that. And then it came, was brought over to Southern Africa and Africans fomented a lot of revolutions there. You've got, really got to understand what liberation theology is about. And liberation theology is a Marxist doctrine hidden underneath the clothing of Christian uh, language. So now when you seek first the kingdom, um, seek you first the kingdom, it says, and all else will be added unto you. That's the kingdom of Yahweh. But when it's interpreted in liberation theology, it's seek you first the political kingdom, and then everything else will be added. This is how they go underneath. They come in with liberation theology, appear very Christianese on the top, that the Christians are, are both evangelicals and Protestants, uh, Protestants and Catholic are, are quite okay at the top. This is how they've got it. But underneath, they redefine all the terms, which is very much a left-wing approach to redefine language, to change meaning. They actually have different terms. So when, you, when we talk as a conservative, that's what I see in America, when conservatives talk democracy and liberals talk democracy, they don't realize they're talking at the same table about democracy or whatever, but actually they mean two totally different things. And they don't go back and say, well, this is what I mean by democracy as opposed to what you mean by democracy. And, and so this is, this is, if you don't get into understanding this, how they're redefining words, you miss actually the real heart of the struggle that's going on. And that's why people, you'll see, just can't, don't agree with each other because they've redefined the words, right? So um, then there was something else that came out very interesting, which I, I've seen as the latest reports from the Pope um, of what he's concerned about, about the G20 meetings. Now, this is very telling, very telling. The, the latest report was to a reporter in Italy. Uh, the, the Vatican of Pope actually phoned this, this uh, Pope Francis phoned this Italian newspaper, La Repubblica. And, um, and, and he said that uh, the United States of America, Russia, China, North Korea, and Bashar Assad al-Assad Syria, have a distorted vision of the world. Now, that's very interesting. A distorted vision of the world. Una visione distorta della mondo, he reported, right? Your Italian was very good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, so this distortion 
is from the Pope, and he makes this observation in an interview with this uh, this Italian reporter. And he says, I got a call from Pope Francis. It was about noon, and I was at the newspaper, my phone rang, and then the statement gets given directly to him. He says, Pope Francis told me. So it appears that this is a direct personal statement to this reporter. How unusual is that? Okay. Told me to, to, uh, that he was very concerned about the meeting of the G20. And he quotes here, I'm afraid there are very dangerous alliances between powers who have a distorted view of the world. America and Russia, China and North Korea, Russia and Assad in the war in, in, the war in Syria, the Pope said. Now, the translation into the English of what, uh, what this is about is the statement is done this way. I worry about very dangerous alliances between powers which have distort, a distorted vision of the world, America, Russia, China, North Korea, Russian President Vladimir Putin, and Syria's Bashar al-Assad over the war in Syria. It's interesting that he picks out of all of them uh, two people personally, Putin and Assad. But he doesn't pick out any others from even though he brings all these countries here. He doesn't pick up uh, the premier of North Korea, for example, but he mentions to, oh, we've got to note what's actually going on here. And he says the danger concerns immigration. Now, that's interesting, right? So uh, our main and unfortunately growing problem in the world today is that of the poor, the weak, the excluded, which includes migrants. Now, I just want to say, during the week, I saw a report that hundreds of thousands of Syrian uh, refugees are going back to Syria, to their places, under the government of Syria. So that puts, negates the fact that they were all persecuted by Syria and driven out. They actually fled from the violence that was coming through the, all these revolutionary forces that were on the ground and what they were doing. So they, they're, they're going back. Now, look at migration. We also know from a fact that it's not predominantly Syrians. So where have all these others come from? And how did they get there is a question. And why were they, how were they motivated? And who motivated them? And with my background in insight into Africa, I, I can understand how these people would come from all these countries. All of a sudden, with all this motivation to go, it's like they've been drummed up, they've been equipped with some cell phones and some money, and they've been told all these things, and they've suddenly emerged out of all of these countries. And now the Pope says our worry is immigration. Now you've got to start looking at this in terms of what's actually going on. Um, and the Pope carries on and he said, this is why the G20 worries me. It mainly hits immigrants. It's not about, you know, the fact that we, we need to get our economies back on the go. It's not about that uh, nation states are not able to cope with this immigration problem. It's not about Holland is completely challenged and losing their culture. Sweden is losing their culture and all these kinds of things. The issue is the focus concern about immigrants. Where do these immigrants get motivated from? Remember, they're not Syrians. So you can't, they're not all Syrian. They are very minority Syrian. So you have to go and say, well, how did this all come about? How did this all appear with this massive problem? And how come you've got all these NGOs shipping these people across the oceans into Europe? What's going on here? All right. And so the Pope is expressing that the major problem is the immigrants. I believe you've got to understand this in the terms of liberation theology, which is what, where the schism is in the Vatican between conservatives and between, but they don't mention it. And they say, you know, uh, an apostate, they're saying, they won't say that it's apostate, but they're saying that if heresy is being taught, then the Pope will, in the article I uh, um, read, then these cardinals who are having a problem with this, it, it automatically dis disqualifies the Pope. Because they can't try him for heresy, but he has, to, you know what I'm saying? If he teaches here heresy, it disqualifies his office. So there's a huge struggle going on in the Vatican right now. Just like you see the struggle going on in Protestantism between, you know, the, the issues of marriage and, uh, and defining gender and acceptable priesthoods and, 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 and so on and so forth. So this is very, very interesting. Um, in the same interview, the Pope said, in a quote here, I also thought many times to this problem and came to the conclusion that not only, but also for this reason, Europe must make as soon as possible a federal structure. Okay? Yeah. Now, you've got to understand now what's going on here. The Pope is concerned with migration, nothing else. That's the problem. The answer to it is that all these 
I'm worried about the G20 because they, they're making agreements and, 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 and Russia stopped immigration. They don't have it there. Hungary. America's about immigration. Italy is now premier saying about immigration. Hungary don't want and so on. Poland. Yeah, yeah. So now he's dead worried about G20. Why would that be so? Because I, I would, I would uh, suggest that this immigration thing is a major phalanx, a major strategic phalanx of how Jesuit Vaticanism is actually bringing in the mystery Babylon, the world order that they want. In terms of a context of the rising of a mystery Babylon Roman Empire, they need to break down nation states, they need to break down families, they need to break and make it so there's nobody can can be unified on anything now, but only because they've messed up all the... Co- this is ancient Babel, where they've made everybody have their same, their language, and broke down everything else, and then made a new world order where everybody's on the basis of that, and they don't want nation states. They want, inter- at the same time, you've got to remember that Rome's working for interfaith ecumenicalism everywhere. Now, now you, this struggle's been going on. If you understand liberation theology, you'll, you, you could see this straight away because the focus is on the poor. The poor now suddenly are redefined in terms of liberation theology and the church. And on the front, it looks all Christian. But on the back end, you can see it as a revolutionary strategy because I know for a fact history proves this is, this is the basis, basis on which revolutions were fomented in South America and in uh, Southern Africa and other places. It was on the basis of this motivation of Marxism. You see it in America now where the cultural Marxism of the left wing have gone to that approach as well. And there's always been the poor. We know the scriptures teach with the poor. Yeah, the and the issue is that... that the prosperity uh, and the blessing of a nation will deal with the poor. But if you want to break the whole nation and you use the guise of an argument that you've actually got to uh, help the poor, it's fallacious because people are being taken from their families. Uh, they've been told to go to Europe. It's only young men and uh, men in their prime going. There's no families going with them. They're going to be lawless there. They have no boundaries around them and they're there for a reason. And the reason is far deeper than we can understand by looking in the eye in the modern day politics. But when you understand in terms of the context of the rising of a mystery Babylon and what destruction must take place to be able to bring that in, uh, together with things like transhumanism and robotics and all these other things, it's going to cause such discontent. These people coming in are not going to fill all the jobs that, that, that they're saying that they're looking for. So there's going to be a massive a proportion of people who are going to be very uh, frustrated uh, in the future. So you can see it's all to do with causing people to uh, get off the fence and contest and everybody, what you should have said, watch out because brother will turn against brother. That's the context of it. So the script, that's what's going on here. Uh, if you look at this amazing report that the, that the Pope would phone up, personally would phone up a, a uh, reporter not go through anybody of his uh, journal, whoever his media department is, but actually personally phones this journalism up and gives him this and makes a statement. All right. I don't know if it was actually the Pope speaking, but from the way the article is written, it seems so what the reporter is saying, or it's his right arm person who's selling that. This is what the Pope said, right? So um, what we've got in this G20 uh, is a very, very interesting scenario. And in the background, what the Pope is doing, and you can see they're worried about the strategy. This is a strategy that they're worried about. And they're worried about Putin and Assad and Assad not breaking the whole thing, you know, not submitting to the whole uh, agenda that they have, that they've created, the narrative they've created. They're worried about Trump and Putin getting a good relationship together. This is threatening their, their, their agenda. The direct, direct, which is why the Pope got on and said, we're in a very dangerous place about these nations. I find this absolutely amazing it tells us exactly what the what they're planning so um the question you have to ask yourself is what is the heart motive and i, I believe what i've been summarizing is the heart motive the vehicle is liberation theology the heart motive is to actually take over zion ultimately take over mount zion physically yeah. because yeah. they've already got agreements yeah. and everything in yeah. place okay so now um the question is now we see the struggle now between certain nations and their big powers and they're not succumbing to this. That's why he says it's very dangerous. The G20 is very dangerous. That's because they're not on board with, their, with what they want to do. So that's why he says, and what's my proof? Because immediately the EU must now become a federal situation. 
well, what does it mean? You have your own army, you do your own thing, right? And basically you cast off the Americas and, the, and, and any of these global things because I see that starting to collapse now, right? And that people, I, I think that most sovereign leaders don't want World War Three, but they, they want to ferment it. And unless if, if you come along on their side and if they saw this globalism and this migration, which will break if the fabric of every society would be their vehicle towards what they do. On the other hand, they're doing ecumenical stuff. And on the other hand, they're negotiating and have negotiated agreements already where they actually uh, have total legal custodianship over Mount Zion. Correct. So, um, so the issue is that um, can the, uh, the nationalist, let's say nationalist globalist struggle succeed? And I don't think it can. Ultimately, it's just a breather. I believe it's a time when it's like a reprieve. It's like we can, people are waking up to see fathers giving us eyes to see, to hear, and people are realizing not all is well here. Uh, the future looks pretty stark. Can they succeed? I don't think biblical prophecy tells us that they will succeed. In small measure, they will succeed because clearly at the end of all this judgment that Yahweh is bringing forward, there will be nations. And nationalism is actually a biblical principle because Yahweh created 72 ethnic groups and he calls the people of the nations. And the prophets talk about the nations shall come up. So what's going to happen is a tremendous struggle between this, between this globalist um, uh, which I believe is, 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 is Babel motivation. It's, it's motivated by the adversary. That's why I know why the Pope would be so concerned here. The thing is that they'll, they'll succeed in the short term. They will succeed because certain prophecies need to be fulfilled about Mount Zion. But that in, in itself is the way that the Father's allowing this. You see, Joseph was in control of the Goshen narrative to come up so that the wicked will come under their judgment. In the process, though, it teaches us about what we should be interceding about because, because uh, Denu, uh, Ben Noon points out some prophecies that are written in the prophets where the lawless ones of Judah are actually facilitating this as well. So, you know, there are big things. So we've got to pray for the preservation of Yahweh's righteous in both houses because both houses are going to be directed. And I've always spoken about Hosea's prophecy that, that Judah will be pushed out of what we now know as the modern state of Jerusalem with, with, with the um, state of Israel, with, with Jerusalem as the, what they would believe want as their capital and their home, right? And they're going to go to the coastline. That is the Hosea prophecy. Mm -hmm. At the same time, uh, I believe they find, it says there, they find shelter there. This is another Bosra Goshen part of the Goshen mm -hmm. narrative in the same way that Ephraim, you know, in, has, finds his narrative in the twos and threes, um, and actually, um, in terms of the Ezekiel 2620 prophecy, 2021, 1920, 21, come my people, go into your house, go into your chamber, close the door for a little while I'm until the indignation be overpassed because I'm rising to judge the nations. So what we're seeing is, in what I'm raising here, is this extreme anxiety by the Pope on what's going on at the G20. He doesn't like what's happening there for certain reasons. Um, and the first one is migration. The other one is climate change. He the two together. And both of them are basically fomented, in my view, by uh, liberation theology, which comes from Jesuit Creek. There's no doubt they're the ones who, who've actually created this. Uh, and so we're in a situation where if you go to any institution now, because this has been going on for a long time, that um, Jesuit Creek, Freemasonry, Knights Templars, and all this, because it all starts to come together, have infiltrated all institutions yeah. everywhere, even in third world Africa and all over. And this is how this whole thing is being motivated and continues. So we've got to know that when we're praying about it um, and interceding, we know that actually it's infiltrated the whole of society, all these societies. It's gone everywhere. And, and what we're seeing everywhere, if you want to understand the context, Italy, the premier, we can no longer do this. So Italy is saying, sorry, we can't go along with the Pope's injunction here because the Pope is pushing it heavily. Now, remember that, it was in Italy that the Pope was driven right back to the Vatican and they only allowed to, them to have the Vatican land. They were actually, even Italy kept them contained. So there was a waking up some time back um, and, and there's a waking up happening now um, in that sense. This is what they're worried about. This is what they're really worried about. They're worried about Trump and Putin being able to get it together and have some sort of agreement. Uh, Syria will remain in place. Uh, and I've got these two audios 
And there are others that Stephen, I don't agree with everything necessarily that Stephen Ben Moons talks about. But the two audios I want you to listen to today are about, one, um, that the Pope, in his understanding, and he's looking at the prophetic word, that the Pope is, actually has total hegemony over the state of Z- over, over the Jerusalem city That's and uh, Mount Zion. Yep. Um, and how they've pushed the Jew, literally just pushed that like in Hebron. The, the, there was another report this week that, uh, that the UNESCO, you see, also part of this thing, has just completely allocated uh, the, 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 what is it, the place of the patriarchs, the, the, oh, where the, the Hebron, patriarchs the Hebron. in Hebron, that that is now part of the Palestinian uh, state, got, and the Jews have no right over it at all. So that, this is the kind of thing that's going on, right? And we've been watching this for a while. I mean, it's 2012 already. I was expecting the, because they've already declared it, the implementation of the um, internationalization of the city of Jerusalem. Well, it looks as though it could be right up front, and this is what it's all about. Mm -hmm. That's the first audio. Erev Tov, I'm Stephen Ben-Noon, and you are watching Israeli News Live. Uh, We have very shocking news, uh, written proof, actual written documentation that the Vatican fully intends to build the third temple. And as well with building the third temple, they will also have world domination, world global power, and will rule from Jerusalem. And I know that sounds very, uh, maybe in some people's eyes, it sounds far-fetched, it sounds outlandish, but nonetheless, we have written proof that this is actually going to take place. Now, before I share with you this documentation, I want to take you um, and just kind of kind of recap some of the things that have happened in Israel uh, where the Vatican is concerned. And and first, keep in mind, the Vatican has refused to acknowledge Israel's right of existence as far as a sovereign state and a people there. They still have not come out quite out and fully acknowledge this. Uh, They're very heavily involved with the Palestinians in order for the Palestinians to be a state. They've been heavily involved in the negotiations for a two-state solution, uh, even hosting at uh, the Vatican uh, a a memorial service, planting in their garden there the two olive trees there in Rome uh, by uh, former President uh, Shimon Peres, as well as uh, Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the Palestinian uh, organization that is there. And... Even as far back, Shimon Peres, of course, has played a major role in this back in 1993 in the Oslo Accords. He was doing secret meetings with the Vatican. And, of course, uh, coming out of that in 1994, declarations were signed. A diplomatic relationship was started by Israel and uh, the Vatican. Of course, in Israel's documents, uh, they call them the Holy See. I wouldn't call them the Holy See, period. Uh, but nonetheless, let me just share with you some of this document that's that's published on Israel Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And we'll kind of sc- scan through this quickly. It says here, this agreement is made on the basis of the provisions of the fundamental agreement between the state of Israel and the Holy See, which was signed on the 30th of December, 1993, and then entered into force on March 10th, 1994. Here and after, the fundamental agreement is what it's called. Okay, recalling that the Holy See is the sovereign authority of the Catholic Church, the state of Israel agrees to assure full effective in Israeli law to legal personality of the Catholic Church itself. Okay, Article 3, the state of Israel agrees to assure full effect in Israeli law in accordance with the provisions of this agreement to the legal personality of the following. These Eastern Catholic uh, patriarchates, the Greek uh, Mikhait Catholic, the Syrian Catholic, the Mor- uh, Moronite, uh, the Chaldean, the Armenian Catholic, here and after the Eastern Catholic uh, patri- uh, excuse me, pa- patriarchates. You know, so they're covering everything that they possibly can. It says the Latin patriarchate of Jerusalem, ID uh, EST, the Latin patriarch diocese of Jerusalem. Uh, the present diocese of the Eastern Catholic uh, patriarchates, 
the new diocese wholly in Israel, Eastern Catholic or Latin as may exist from time to time. So Israel is giving them broad laws, broad acceptance. And of course, in many of these things here, uh, a lot of laws can change it at time from time. Uh, says also for the avoidance of doubt, it is stated that the question of assuring full effect in Israel law to the legal personality of any new cross border diocese is left open. As that's what I said, they, they leave op wide open to make changes even. For the purpose of this agreement, a parish is integral part of the respective diocese and without affecting its status under the canon law will not acquire a separate legal personality under the Isra Israeli law. A diocese may subject to the canon law authorize itself parishes to act on its behalf in such matters and under such terms as it may determine. Uh, in this agreement, diocese includes its synonyms or equivalents. Uh, the state of Israel in Article 4, Israel agrees to assure full effect in the Israeli law in accordance with the provisions of this agreement to the legal personality of the custody of the Holy Land. What? To the legal personality of the custody of the Holy Land. Now, is this saying that in Article 4, they actually have it? I mean, now, it, it may see, it seems a little vague in there. Notice what he says. This says, the state of Israel agrees to assure full effect in Israeli law in accordance with the provisions of this agreement to the legal personality of the custody of the Holy Land. Now, this isn't what I'm talking about as far as the documentation. No, it's not the written documentation I'm talking about as yet as far as the third temple. But that in itself is pretty powerful. This is why you saw in regards to David's tomb and the site of the Last Supper above the top of that, that the Catholic Church was given all of that. No referendum, no voting, no... The rabbi was not allowed to, to make any... any uh, statement in regarding that they were just told to shut up and they brought in special forces to enforce that they could have communion service not just upstairs in the last supper room where the pope actually had it at but they even throw the worshipers out of king david's tomb which i say worshipers they're there praying that's a place they believe in praying where people have passed away i'm not for that but that's what they believe in and they throw them out of there and they sit there and do a communion service in there. This is why this article includes several different branches of the Catholic Church. Not just Roman Catholic. They're all up underneath the pontiff. They're all up underneath the Pope of Rome. They throw them out. They do the communion inside of there because they wanted to show the Jews that we own all of it. They took Mount Zion. Anyway, so you can read this for yourself. This is actually on www mfa.gov.il. This is Israel's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It's a very long article. I'll read you a little another section here in Article 8. For the avoidance of doubt, nothing in this agreement shall be construed as supporting an, uh, an argument that in any of the legal persons to which the agreement applies had not been a legal person prior to this agreement. The party makes a claim that such a legal person had not been in legal person in Israeli law prior to this agreement, that party shall bear the burden of proof. See, Article 9. Uh, should a question with regard to the canon law arise in any of the matter before a court or forum other than in a forum of the Catholic Church, it shall be regarded as a question of fact. <laughs> this, this is amazing. Amazing without a doubt. Um, but anyway, there, there's 13 articles, which is kind of interesting, 13 articles. Let me read Article 13 for you. This agreement shall enter into force in the date of the letter, latter notification of ratification by a party done in two original copies in the Hebrew and in English language, both texts being equally authentic in case of the d divergence. The English text shall prevail except where explicitly provided otherwise in the schedule. Signed in Jerusalem this 10th day of the month of November in the year 1997, which corresponds to the 10th day of the month of Hishvan in the year 5758. And that's kind of interesting that they made sure that those two days corresponded. I thought that was kind of interesting. Nonetheless, though, Shimon Perez sold out 
Israel, to the Vatican. And since then, Prime Minister Netanyahu, who for a long time I had a high regard for him because of his stand against uh, Rome and not doing a two-state solution. But now we see him backpedaling. And he's even gone to Rome and been part of the negotiations of a two-state solution. And as I showed you in, a, in, a, in, a, in an article on Israeli News Live not too long ago, we took you and showed you all around Jerusalem, the building of the superhighways there. And they're building even a checkpoint from Tel Aviv into Jerusalem. A checkpoint. Now, I can understand a checkpoint being from the West Bank on the, on the, on the um, uh, eastern side coming up because you're coming from the West Bank. You have the Palestinian area there. It's the Dead Sea from the highway from the Dead Sea. You have to go through the checkpoint because you're dealing with the West Bank coming into Jerusalem. You need to check the Palestinians. But why would Israel be constructing a checkpoint that is on the main highway one that comes from Ben Gurion Airport from Tel Aviv coming west to the east right up through the mountains there. All of this is Israeli territory. And now they're building a checkpoint that Jews, Israelis, are going to have to go through a checkpoint from Israeli territory to enter into Jerusalem. Why? If they're not planning on internationalizing this city. If they're not planning on taking this city for themselves. Now, I told you I had written documentation. And this comes from the very book I've shared with you before, Morals and Dogma, The Ancient and Accepted Right. As I said, there's no ISBN number. Um, you'll see on your screen here, page 816. I didn't photograph page 815 because I'm only reading one sentence off there as it begins there. But it says here on page 815, the avowed object of the Templars, that's the Knight of Templars, was to protect the Christians who came to visit the holy places. Now, we're already on page 816. You should be able to see this on your screen now. Their secret ob object was the rebuilding of the Temple of Solomon on the model prophesied by Ezekiel. This rebuilding formally predicted by the Judaizing mystics of earlier ages had become the secret dream of the patriarchs of the Orient. The Temple of Solomon rebuilt and consecrated to the Catholic worship would become in effect the metropolis of the universe. The East would prevail over the West and the patriarchs of Constantinople would possess themselves of the papal power. Close quote of the book. Did, did you hear what they said? I'm just going to highlight it again. We'll post it back on the screen, but I want to highlight this again for you. The avowed object of the Templars, the Knight of Templars, was to protect the Christians who come to visit the holy places. Now, this is one of the things that the Vatican is wanting to do, is they're wanting to bring this about. And Shimon Perez, when he was making the agreement, said that they would bring the United Nations in, they would internationalize Jerusalem so that all nations and all religions can come and worship under protection. That's what the Knights of Templars were to do, the Christians who came to visit the holy places. This secret object was the rebuilding of the temple of Solomon on the model prophesied by Ezekiel. See, so it's supposed to be a secret rebuilding. This wasn't, this wasn't supposed to be let out that the Vatican is, is a part of this. Not just the Templars, the Knights of Templars, the Masons, they're all the same thing, the Jesuits. That's why you have a Jesuit Pope now. This rebuilding formally predicted by Judaizing mystics. Now, my Jewish brothers, they just call you a bunch of Judaizing mystics. Isn't that interesting? You're just a bunch of Judaizing mystics in their eyes. And Prime Minister Netanyahu, you would make a deal with Rome when they call you just a bunch of Judaizing mystics? Do you not know what they think of you? of the earlier ages, had become the secret dream of the patriarchs of the Orient. Hmm. 
the temple of Solomon rebuilt and consecrated to what? To the Catholic worship would become, in effect, the metropolis of the universe. I told you they're wanting to internationalize the city of Jerusalem. That's exactly what they said they would do. And they're going to do it for what? For Catholic worship. They're building a third temple for Catholic worship. It's not for the Jews. It's for Catholic worship. And notice what it says at the end. And the East would prevail over the West. Well, the United States, and we see all the evangelicals, they would be conquered. The East will prevail over the West. The Eastern Christian Church will prevail over the West that kind of got away from Christianity the way that they, they shouldn't have been, they shouldn't have left Mother Rome. So they're going to prevail over the West. And the patriarchs of Constantinople, Constantine and the group that started the Vatican in 325, along with his Mithras priest that were not Christians, they just adopted some Christianity in there a little bit because why? Constantine wanted to unite church and state to have more power. And then they went and killed all the true Christians off. That's what the, that's what the Crusades were all about. It wasn't so much to hunt down the Jews, it was hunt down the Jewish Christians that were true believers that kept Sabbath, kept the Ten Commandments the way God intended them to be kept. Anyway, the Constantinople would possess themselves of the papal power. This is how papal reign, this is how Pope Francis truly intends to reign, is from Jerusalem. Through Catholic worship, through the third temple, Solomon's temple being rebuilt. And you don't think they're going to do it? You can believe they're going to do it. It's only a matter of time. And the Jewish, my Jewish brethren, you're being duped. They called you Judaizing mystics. You know? God will bring our temple to us out of heaven, not from the Pope of Rome. And this is what's interesting. Even on the, and I've been there myself. I've seen it for myself. I needed to see this for myself. The Ark of Titus, as it's called, right there in Rome, not far from the Vatican, where Titus, when they came back with the temple treasures, the menorah pictured on there and several other artifacts that were that were brought back to Rome. I know the Vatican was not, quote-unquote, a church at that point as of yet. No, I understand that. But Constantine, they, they put, though, they hid those artifacts. And, of course, when the Catholic Church was first formed, that's who took over these artifacts. And the Catholic Church is proud of this symbol. They state clearly that the, the menorah coming to Rome was showing that the light of of Israel was being passed now to them. Replacement theology. Replacement theologists are going to come to Israel and they're going to build a third temple. They're going to provide the funds. They've already said they would provide the funds for doing it. And they're going to build it for universal worship in a universal city for a papal Catholic worship and papal reign. That's what's coming. That is breaking news. I'm Stephen Benu with... Israeli News Live. Shalom. Okay, um, I'm just mindful of the time as it's pressed on. The other one is very interesting in terms of his analysis of prophecy um, and how the he he or how he's looking at it in terms of excuse me Syria being the catalyst to this whole thing. Um, uh, that actually that will bring into place the Gog Magog war. That's that's the next audio I wanted to play, play. And so I'll put it there for you to download and listen to in your own time. So the situation is quite interesting. That There's this troop buildup that's happening. You've had a sensitivity of conflict because there's been already the Syrian jet that was shot down and Russia's been on edge and they broke down their talks. And then this G20 meeting has come about um, where Putin and and um, Trump have now come into agreement about putting the ceasefire process back into place. And the Pope comes out and says, this is very, very dangerous. So 
these dots are very clear to yeah. see. Well, the, uh, he, men he mentioned this book, uh, Morals and Dogma, right? Yeah. To just give a little bit of information about that, that that's was written by Albert Pike in the, I think, 16, 17 hundreds or somewhere around there. And he is the architect of Freemasonry. And Freemasonry was, was set up by the Roman Catholic Church to counter the Reformation. And in October this year, they have... They will accomplish that. Have accomplished it, right? Yes. And in this book, Morals and Dogma, Albert Pike writes about the start of the First World War, which is 100% correct. He writes about the start of the Second World War. Who started and why started. Yes, yes. who and why, 100% yeah. correct. And he's also written about the Third World War, which will start in the Middle East, right? And is exactly the plane which the Pope once executed. And there, of course, what Simon Peres did, that agreement in, in, the, in the 1990s, is absolutely 100% what he's saying. I know about it personally because um, Simon Peres was always an advocate of a Middle East without borders so that it is one place where we can do all our oil drilling and all our gas drilling and we can trade. And therefore all these groups who cause all these problems have to go. And he sent one of his Jesuits friends, which was a Frenchman with a letter to the Pope agreeing to the structure, which he's outlined in relation to the Vatican taking over the city of Jerusalem, because I don't know if you people know this, but we have already got three independent city-states, which is Rome. The Vatican is an independent city-state. London is an independent city-state. Washington is an independent city-state. And so will be Jerusalem, right? So that from Rome, that's where the spiritual dogma and teachings will be made. Jerusalem is where the worship will take place. London is where the finance will be controlled and Washington yeah, enforces the political will of the new world order. And so the therefore, and the military and the military. So therefore all these states have to be above and out of nationality, nationality Na and, nations. And, and, yes. and, and nations and, and nations, yeah. right? because you are the ruling class, you know, they are the ones who are going to rule and therefore are not subject to, you know, well, I don't know if people know, but the British crown, legally also belongs to the Vatican. That's, yes. that's, that's years back under King yeah. James. Yeah. Under a treaty with Rome. Yeah. Right. You know, and Washington was built under Freemason, uh, totally Freemasonry planned. You know, one of their big lodges in Washington, you know, have all the great men there, including pictures of Billy Graham, sorry to say. Mm. And this man is shocked about Benjamin, Benjamin, Benjamin Netanyahu but if you look at the history of all the leadership of Israel, from Weissman right, to Benjamin Netanyahu, are all 33 degree Masons. You know? So he is fully au fait with the plane. There is no two ways about it, you know? And they are in one and the same club. The only thing which they have from time to time is that you have 33 degree Masons on this side of the coin. And like, for example, Benjamin Netanyahu is a 33 degree Mason, but so was Yasser Arafat, right? But he's on the other side of the coin, you know? So we instigate these things against, you know, uh, thesis and antithesis out of which we get yeah, synthesis. Well, that's classic Jesuit. That's it. Jesuit. Yeah. So what this guy is saying, I can uh, uh, testify that this is absolutely correct. And the documents exist and was instigated by Simon Paris. And it is actually fulfilling the plan of Albert Pike, who is, the, who is the big man in Freemasonry and wrote this book, Morals and Dogma, which you can only have if you are a 33 degree Mason. You know? mm. And on your death, it goes back to the lodge of which you are a member. But some of them have been uh, uh, made available. And I know through one South African professor whose father-in-law was a 33 degree Mason and had this book. And on his death, he didn't return it to the lodge, but he took it. Right. And uh, I can testify to that, that this is correct. Yeah. So what you have, if people want to understand why, like in America, they talk about 
the conflict to drain the swamp of Washington. It's because Washington is a separate city. It's in its own world. I mean, it's actually ruled by different people, the same as London is in the same thing, and what you're saying, Jerusalem and Rome. So he mentioned one other, Constantinople. Yep. So that's where you see the, the Islamic, um, you know, with the Temple of Sophie, where the Islamic Rome together that meets, so that the whole thing comes together. So you've got this unification of Rome, rabbinicalism, and Islamism through those cities. And then you've got the, the uh, civil jurisprudence by Washington. And then you've got the banking by London, the financial and economic. So the whole, that is the whole world order that, that the whole thing circulates on. Yeah. If we can and he was, he was surprised and a little bit annoyed that uh, Netanyahu was now agreeing to this t- two station, two, two nation, states, two, two states, states set up. Yes. But you see, that's foretold in, in the book of Joel, you know, they have departed my land. They have sought to divide it. Yes. Yeah. And divide it. that's when Yahweh will act. Yahweh will act, you know, when, when the whole of, of Protestantism says we have no king but Caesar yeah. in, so in, in October, October of this year. Yes. And as soon as they divide his land, right, he says then he will act. Yeah. So, so that's not a far off horizon. No. So in terms of what we're discussing here, um, the expectation is whether the ceasefire agreement would hold in, the, in Syria. So, um, or whether in fact, um, you know, the R- Rome's network, which is far greater in influence in all these things than uh, just the American conservatives trying to save their nation. And, and, and so, um, that's, that gives us something to give a context for our intercession, I believe, that we need to intercede for the whole house. It's not just interceding for, for those who are of, of the house of Israel, Ephraim, believers in Yeshua, who understand, you know, um, the, the, the Hebraic heritage of the faith. It's actually to intercede for the remnant of Judah mm-hmm. as well. Um, and it could be, and I'm, I'm, you know, not saying thus is Yahweh at all, but this might be heading up with a sign in the heavens and with the Protestants collapsing and the situation in the Middle East developing as it is. When the Pope starts coming out and saying the G20 is very dangerous, you know that they're going to start the other side is we've now suddenly said, now we have to make a Europe a republic. So that's what we'll watch for very shortly. They're going to put the screws down on Italy in terms of this migration thing. It's interesting that America and, and and Britain can stand outside in a sense, but that's because they've got, they're governed by these two cities that, that are, will come through in the end for them. I believe that's probably what's happening. Mm-hmm. The common people are just going to be brushed aside. It doesn't matter who you are, whether you, what nation you are, they're going to put this thing in place. So in that context, we don't fear because Yahweh says this is going to come to pass. We know this is in the prophets and in the prophecies. And, as Joseph is sitting in the Goshen narrative, he's actually allowing this whole thing and facilitating to come to pass so that it can come under judgment. So you need to be in your Goshen where you can draw near unto Yahweh, yeah. you know, where you, um, where you live and try to live the lifestyle that he, uh, he uh, asks us to live. And you trust in him 100% like Abraham did. Yeah. You, know? you trust in the promises of Yahweh. And if you are written on the palms of his hand, right, if he is for us, who shall be against us? Yeah. There's nothing to worry about. So um, the thing about um, the Bosra Goshen narrative is that this battle is not our battle. No. The issue is that it is in the, in the Goshen narrative, it is, it's Joseph, who's a picture of Yeshua. He's the one who's, who's standing between his people and Pharaoh and Egypt. In the Bosra narrative, it is again Yeshua, who's the, with his garments, comes and he redeems. He puts them into his little sheepfold, and then he protects it, and he goes and does work. So um, our job is, is, is to repent, to uh, not be afraid, do not fear, but to see the redemption of Yahweh yeah, coming. stand still and see the redemption uh, of Yahweh. But yeah. what we're seeing now is that they're going to start putting this thing into, into plan, because if the Pope is saying it's dangerous, you know they're going to be now called to attention. Quick action's got to happen. So um, my expectation is probably Syria may deteriorate badly. The uh, Isaiah 17 may come to fulfillment in the not too dear future. And as, as you say, the, the final straw, I think, what, you're, what you've labored on several times, is going to be when it's like the, the Elijah line of October, when, when Protestantism makes its decision uh, in its institutions to join with Rome, and they have that point, 
then those who are left who will not will come out of Protestant because that's the only thing if they're walking strictly to Yeshua's word. And then basically we have a situation where, um, as you say, Yahweh will act. Yahweh, you read many times in the scriptures, you know, where Yahweh says, for example, about the Amorites, the sin of the Amorites was not yet full. Right? Yes. So there has to be a fullness of the sin of men before Yahweh will act, right? Which includes the division of the land, you know? And it, and, and it, is, it is, we have no other king but Jesus, we, uh, the Caesar. We, 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 we away with him, you know? We yeah. don't want him anymore. That's what and, the Protestants will be saying yeah, if they accept the Pope. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And we can see that this is exactly happening all around the world. Yahweh and God has to be written out of everything, right? Mm-hmm. We can no longer pray in the schools in America. You know, we can't do that anymore. You know, it has to, all has to go and has to disappear. And then when the sin of mankind is full, then Yahweh will act. Well, it'll certainly come when this, this temple is put up. Uh, I don't think they necessarily have a whole temple. They'll start their services. That's all they need to do. You know, they'll, they'll get their services on their calendar going and things like that. 